Are you are you started? Yep, good. yep. Okay. You want to introduce? Go ahead. Oh, I'm introducing. Okay. Well, uh, yeah, why not? Whatever. It doesn't okay. matter. Okay. <laughs> well, I'm grateful to be back here again with Charlie Zeiss at Stargate Pyramids, and we're going to be discussing again a little bit more about the sacred geometry of the Russian pyramids. We already have a video on Charlie's channel, and this video will also be there and at my channel as well. So I'm George Leoniak of New Geometry. Really excited to be here today, sharing more discoveries about the sacred geometry of the Russian Giza pyramid. And Charlie, how are you today? I'm, I'm doing great. Thanks, George. Hope you had a good new year. Mine was uneventful, which meant it was great. <laughs> <laughs> that sounds good. Um, well, we do have a short, uh, well, my, we don't know how long it's going to be. We've got quite a number of slides to go through. Charlie and I were just recently on Sasha Stone's uh, symposium. So we that that video wasn't made public. So we wanted to, you know, take a lot of the material that we had in there, make it available to our channels and add more additional information um, that we had to, you know, leave out of that video. So if you've seen that already, you might want to stick around for this one. Um, and if you're new to this, you're going to get a double dose of a lot of material coming up that we've tried to condense into this one. So I'd say, Charlie, you're going to lead us off to jump into it. So why okay. don't you sure. why don't take it away? All right. I'm going to share my screen here. And uh, these are essentially the same uh, slides. We've, we've put in some new material as well. Uh, a lot of you have seen a lot of the... the um, examples of this that I showed to the general audience. So I've cut out some of those. But, you know, just to start with, we're going to be talking about sacred geometry and the organizing principles of the universe. Essentially, what we're going to show is that mankind has known about this specific geometry. It's the geometry. It's one of several, I guess, geometries of, of five spirals that we can find. But this seems to be the one that nature uses uh, to scale everything from the subatomic to the galactic. And what we're going to be showing today is that mankind has used this very same geometry in architecture for thousands of years. But most importantly, uh, in the second half of the presentation, George and I got together about six or seven weeks ago now, and George was working on trying to develop uh, sacred geometry drawings of the Russian pyramid he, we came across each other. He saw a, a video that I had done where I was uh, correlating, excuse me, the platonic solids with the Russian pyramid geometry. And that's how we got started. But George is going to be presenting what is going to be, I think, for the first time, uh, other than at Sasha's event, uh, we're going to be demonstrating that we can combine this 76.345 geometry with uh, the scaling of fractals with the scaling of the platonic solids and all of this will fit <clears throat> inside uh, a spherical torus. So essentially we have come together, put together for the first time, a true model that links all of these things together. So mm -hmm. that's where we're going to start. And uh, these are just three examples of uh, um, buildings. One is uh on the left is uh, the new Amazon headquarters in Arlington, Virginia. Uh, the middle picture is um, a, a drawing called Babylonus Murai. And then finally, uh, the great mosque of Samara, Iraq. Uh, these are just three examples uh, that we we see of this geometry. Now, I didn't mention this during Sasha's because we were rushed for time. But if you'll notice, one of the the things that's different on this page is the fact that the Amazon headquarters, the spiral is actually going in an opposite direction from uh, the, the other two. And I, I don't know exactly why they did that, but um, the, the normal uh, way of, of, of uh, drawing this, because this is the way scientists have determined that, that they flow is with what's called a right-hand rule. If you hold a, like a, a, a a, um, a a pen in your hand and your thumb is pointing upward, uh, the direction here should be spinning is the direction that your fingers are wrapping around the pen. And that would be in a clockwise direction as in the left and right. So I can't tell you why they chose to do it in an opposite direction. 
but there must be, I, or there could be some symbolic meaning there. Hmm. Any, yeah. go ahead, George. Oh, I didn't have anything to say there, Charlie. Keep oh, going. okay. That was just me. I'm, I'm coughing a little bit. Oh, here, you want so. me to take over with your slides? <laughs> no, I can't do that. Let's see what's going on here. Let's try to get this. Let's see if you can it's advance. Not, it's not letting me advance. What's going on? Uh, the arrow on the keyboard, down arrow. Does that work for you? Well, let's find out. There we go. Okay, so sorry for that, but um, just by way of introduction, um, civilizations around the world have used sacred geometry for free energy and healing for thousands of years, yet we're not aware of any of this. And that's what my book is really all about, is to point this out. Evidence of, uh, of this is hiding in plain sight in architecture, which is my primary focus. Uh, it's in hieroglyphs, it's in uh, technology, both ancient and contemporary, as well as in sacred geometry diagrams that uh, George is going to be showing you later in the presentation. Now, the Phi Spiral is a classic example of one of these hidden sacred geometry technologies. Uh, Nikolai Kozarev, who was considered to be the father of torsion physics, <clears throat> he proved the existence of these spiraling torsion fields in the 1950s, and Victor Schauberger used uh, the spirals in water as the inspiration for his free energy technologies as well. And we'll be talking about all of these later in the presentation. But our knowledge of sacred geometry uh, has been suppressed in large part by the elimination of the study of the quadrivium. Now, the quadrivium is a, an advanced course of, of study uh, that was taught by Plato and has its origins back probably to Pythagoras, if not uh, uh, earlier, but uh, it combined mathematics, harmonics, um, geometry, and cosmology. So all of that sacred knowledge was lost at the beginning of the Renaissance because uh, the decision was made to no longer teach that. Interestingly enough, it was precisely at that time that the Gothic cathedral construction came to an end as well. So, I mean, to me, it doesn't sound like we entered into a Renaissance. We probably went into the Dark Ages uh, at the beginning of the Renaissance. And George may have some comments on that too later. But just to finish up, I mean, it's really one of the greatest tragedies, I think, that's ever been perpetrated on mankind because the quadrivium the purpose of study of the quadrivium is to find first causes or first principles, the organ such as the organizing principles of matter in the universe that we're going to be talking about today. So briefly, you know, for those on my channel, you've seen this before, but you know, this is basically how I was able to, to re-engineer the uh, geometry of the Russian pyramids. I took a, a protractor app and was able to measure it doesn't come out this precisely uh, the first time you do it, but I knew I was going to be very close to 76.345 degrees uh, by just doing a direct measurement of a picture. And knowing that the phi spiral was so important to Kozarev and to others uh, in the field of torsion physics, I decided uh, that I wanted to see what would happen if you look at the middle diagram that's in with a black background. I, I, that's what I conceptualized, a series of spheres stacked on top of each other where these torsion fields would be flowing around these spheres, so to speak. And um, uh, when I did the mathematics on that and, and, and determined <clears throat> the slant or slope angle, it turned out to be 76.345 degrees, which uh, matched up perfectly with that of the Russian pyramid. So I, I was feeling good about this. I started to feel even better a couple of weeks later when I actually realized that that 76.345 degree geometry is shared with the Giza pyramid as well. A lot of my customers would were asking me, well, Charlie, is there any relationship between the Giza and the Russian pyramids? Because uh, they look so different. But what I did find out was that sure enough, they share this common angle. On the diagram on the left, you'll see at bottom uh, point F here, 76345 is the 
what's called the slant or slope angle of the Russian pyramid, which is the taller one. But then here at point E, which is the uh, top of the Giza pyramid, uh, you'll see that this very same angle exists. So I knew now at this point that I this was highly significant. Now, the next step was to actually find this in nature. And this is when I really knew that <clears throat> this was, was significant because I found that nature uses this as a, uh, a scaling factor uh, for light. Number one, it, uh, ref light refracts through a glass sphere. Uh, at this very geometry. Uh, the amplification of sound through a megaphone occurs uh, with a megaphone of exactly this geometry. Water, uh, when allowed to create its own funnel, kind of in an unobstructed fashion, uh, ends up, uh, that funnel turns out to have that same slant angle of 76.345 degrees. And finally, uh, we find it in our DNA as well. So this is fundamental to uh, essentially to all aspects of creation and, and scaling in nature. So again, highly significant. So now I want to just show you quickly some of the places where we found this geometry. This is These are just uh, a couple out of hundreds. Uh, I have over a thousand examples in the book of, of photographs of examples of this. But uh, the ob all of the Egyptian obelisks, which are all also related to free energy generation, uh, have this geometry in the pyramidal uh, tops of all of the obelisks. Um, this is a what's called a naragi. It's in uh, the island of Sardinia in uh, the Mediterranean Sea. Uh, there are, were approximately uh, tw upwards to twenty thousand of these that were that are estimated to have been built on this island. What's interesting about this island is the fact that uh, next to many of these naragis, we find burial sites for giants, for you know certainly uh, creatures that were much larger than ourselves. And one has to question knowing, as you'll find out, that, that this geometry, because of its special nature, it's organizing the fields in a coherent fashion, whether that maybe had an effect on the the uh, the size or the height of these uh, of these giants, but uh, today uh, Sardinia is a blue zone, which means that it's one of the areas on the planet that has the highest life expectancy, and I do believe that that is a in large part due to the fact that these naragis are uh, organizing the field uh, to produce health and longevity. All of the Brocks in Scotland have this geometry. Uh, the Great Zimbabwe Ruined in Africa has this. In 2020, Michael Tellinger and Dr. Sam Asmonigich uh, measured a very, very large ionization field coming off of this conical structure. And research at the University of London, as corroborated by the Russian pyramid research, indicate that ionization equates to higher or immune function. Now, here's an example uh, of, a, of a Southern style Dravidian uh, Hindu temple called the Thiruvannamali Hindu temple. We're gonna see some more contemporary examples of free energy, but this is an example of an ancient structure that is believed to have been actually a power plant uh, prior to its incarnation as a, uh, as a temple. Uh, in the top left-hand corner of this screen, we see uh, YouTuber Praveen Mohan. He's he has a video on this temple and indicates, as he's pointing to there, that there is a drawing uh, at the base of the temple indicating that a gigantic uh, uh, Tesla coil is buried inside uh, this, pier this uh, temple and is probably the kind of the source that was used, ground energies to bring into the temple, which were then uh, magnified and clarified through the geometry of 76345. And also at the top, you'll notice there are, uh, on up here, there are 13 uh, balls uh, at the top of the temple. These most likely contained mercury, and uh, that was part of the free energy process uh, that was used at the temple. 
Here's another, this is a Buddhist temple in India as well. You'll see this geometry as well as a coil at the top of the uh, temple, which has this geometry as well. Uh, virtually all of the uh, Gothic cathedrals, this is one of them that uh, about two thirds have this very geometry in the steeples in, um, in these Gothic cathedrals. And these Gothic cathedrals were built uh, from about um, 1100 to uh, 14 to 1500. So uh, these were, I looked at every single um, uh, Gothic cathedral that was listed in Wikipedia. And I'd say probably two thirds of them have this geometry. Uh, another 15% or so have other geometries that we know are associated with the golden ratio. So. You know, I hope that uh, between George and me, we'll be able to figure out the other 10 to 15 percent, uh, you know, in the in the near future. Here's an example of a castle, Konigsberg Castle in Germany. Again, this geometry is found. Uh, this is an example. Uh, you see this as well on many churches where the central uh, steeple uh, is surrounded on each corner by four smaller ones of the same uh, geometry just a different scale and you'll notice these balls on top of each of these uh, that indicate uh, there was mercury involved <clears throat> as well in the free energy process. Here is San Marco Bell Tower in uh, Venice, Italy. Virtually all bell towers around the world uh, use this geometry as we saw earlier uh, in the megaphone example that helps to amplify uh, the sound coming from the bell towers. Here's an example of Tartarian architecture. Uh, Tartaria was an empire uh, that is reputed to have been worldwide. Uh, and that technology is probably spread by this civilization around the world. And that's why we see it. But this is an example. This is uh, St. Basil's Cathedral in Moscow, uh, which we deem to be part of the Kremlin. But you'll see here that uh, this geometry is found in the towers. There's other types of antiquitech here as well called onion domes. That's the green and blue uh, towers that you see here as well, as well as uh, the mercury balls, as well as fractal antennas. So they were using a lot of different technology here to create free energy. But uh, uh, this is an example that and you can find this in variations around the world. Here's another example, one that you wouldn't normally think about, but uh, I remember the, I, I found the Erlenmeyer flask uh, has this geometry as well. Emil Erlenmeyer was a 19th century German organic chemist, and he did a lot of research into uh, double bonding uh, of, of certain carbon compounds. And uh, what he found apparently was that uh, the, the geometry of the beaker was very important in the success of many of his organic chemistry experiments. And this uh, particular uh, flask has now become essentially the industry standard uh, for chemical experiments, particularly in organic chemistry. Now, I just want to point briefly, this, I'm going to take you up to the early 1900s. Uh, church steeples had mimicked the Gothic cathedral geometries for in what's called the neo-gothic style and that continued up until around the beginning of the 1900s when we suddenly saw that geometry totally disappear from western religious architecture now hindu temples eastern orthodox russian orthodox churches they all continue to use it but it has been specifically you know er eradicated in the west and that seems to have been done on purpose. Uh, architects starting at the beginning of the 20th century who attempted to use sacred geometry were vilified and ridiculed, uh, saying that this was just a, an ancient relic that had no purpose. Uh, and of course, what George and I are trying to do is to disprove that notion and bring this knowledge back to the people. Even though it left us in, in secular and, and religious architecture, we do find this uh, geometry, however, in high tech. And 
So it's alive and well, it's just not alive and well in the public education system. So here's an example of a power plant cooling tower. These are used on both coal and nuclear power plants. And essentially what they do is they are as a mechanism whereby you can cool down the steam and recycle that water and use it again and again, rather than uh, taking that hot water and, and putting it, you know, you having to bring in fresh water all the time. So uh, an example of the technology at use in, uh, in a, a peaceful, you know, uh, purpose. But now we're going to get into military technology and aerospace technology. Virtually all of our rockets, missiles, aircraft, uh, uh, all have this. This is a Saturn I rocket. This is a MiG-29 aircraft, a fighter jet from uh, Russia has this geometry. SpaceX, Sputnik. Um, so both aerospace programs know about this geometry as well. And here's an example of a, a concept vehicle that Lockheed Martin has put out for hypersonic uh, travel uh, called the SR-72. So this geometry, people know about it in the in the high tech world, and we use it. But as I say, uh, we're we're finding this. It's not in our textbooks. It's not in our science curriculum. But interestingly enough, all of the aerospace engineers have figured this out, probably through the use of wind tunnels and the like, because sacred geometry is not taught in engineering schools either. So, kind of with that, that's where we're going to stop our brief introduction into the pictures, but. I want to go over now as kind of a, a, a segue into Georgia's section, some of the other information that I picked up that had me believing that that one that we could put together a unified model of the creative process. And so um, that's what I want to show you. The first thing I wanted to want to point out is that uh, fractals uh, scale in the geometry of phi cube. We're gonna be talking about that concept uh, going forward, so keep it in mind. Uh, this is a, a drawing from uh, Richard Merrick's book called Interference. Uh, he has developed a whole, uh, an entire book on a harmonic theory of, of creation. And I think it's must reading for people who are really interested in trying to understand uh, a harmonic view of, of how creation occurs. But in this book, he took uh, what's called a Mandelbrot set. This is a, a classic depiction of fractals uh, that were, this design came from the work of uh, uh, Benoit Mandelbrot in the 1970s. He's, he's credited with discovering fractals. However, uh, fractals go back at least to the ancient Vedas. So even though he, he discovered them, he actually was rediscovering all of this ancient knowledge, just as uh, George and I are trying to do now. But each of these circles, uh, if you look at that very tiny circle, he scaled that as phi, and then the next circle, phi cubed, the lar next larger one, phi to the sixth, and then the last one, phi to the ninth. So we're seeing this phi cubed scaling unit or, or, or octave in, um, in fractals. And uh, when we look at here on the right side, phi cubed is equal to 4.236, which is the slant height ratio of the pyramids that we've been discussing earlier in the presentation. Now, similarly, uh, the platonic solids scale in this uh, ratio of phi cubed as well. I, I kind of saw that if you look at the diagram on the left side of the page, this is from the last page of Robert Lawler's book, uh, Sacred Geometry, Philosophy, and Practice. And when I saw this, this is a, a two-dimensional depiction of the platonic solids, and not really all of the solids are even in this diagram. But when I saw the circumscribing and interscribing uh, circles in this diagram, I immediately started to see this in 3D and saw it as a cone with the very geometry that we were talking about. And sure enough, when you go through the calculations, um, the for those familiar with it, I mean, the, there is a theory that the platonic solids, uh, you know, move from one form to the next in a continuous progression, just like uh, key, keys on a keyboard on the piano. So 
when you look at the ratio uh, here, we have we go from an icosahedron to an octahedron, tetrahedron cubed, dodecahedron, and then back to icosahedron again. Well, those could be viewed as the two icosahedrons is like C octaves on a piano keyboard. And when you check out the uh, the ratio of the circumscribing diameters of the of the circumscribing spheres or or circles, you find this very same four point two three six or phi cubed <clears throat> uh, geometry. So you know we now know that both platonic solids and fractals are going to scale in that uh, proportion. And here's the most important and the last thing I'm going to talk about um, before I turn it over to George is the fact that a, a spherical uh, torus can accommodate this very 76.345 geometry. Now, most of the most of the pictures of, of a torus that you find on the internet are really just artist depictions. And so you really can't make much out of them, but this is a specific award. It's called the break for the Breakthrough Prize in Fundamental Physics. This is the most financially lucrative science award uh, that's given out on the planet. And uh, when I saw this, I had to measure it because I, I was uh, I knew that this uh, specific torus was spherical. So uh, there's a there's a, um, a video that a woman called Fractal Woman on uh, YouTube had put together, and she had discussed the fact that this in order to keep this spherical, that the z axis or the vertical axis has to be scaled in phi. So I thought this was extremely important because now all of a sudden we have the ability to scale inside the torus, which is assumed to be the, the best model of the organizing principles of nature. And we know that the geometry and the scaling is all going to fit together. So, you know, with that said, is what would that, you know, I just want to show you quickly what that would look like Essentially, what I'm saying is you could you could kind of interpose that pyramidal structure that that I had devised, you know, earlier in the presentation, and that can show you kind of that's the that's the under under half of the of the pyramid of the torus, and that's what's going to be powering the pyramid or excuse me the torus uh, movement. Uh, so, with that said, I'm going to turn it over now to uh, to George, because. George is now going to demonstrate those very uh, principles that we talked about, putting all of this together in a model. And this is something that we've never seen before. So this is very exciting and powerful information. So George, yeah. look forward to yeah. taking oh, over. Yeah, yeah, I so, said, well, I'm coming on. Uh, thanks so much for sharing that. Uh, and I, I just love seeing the pictures again. It's just amazing to me how many places of the thousand places in the book. I mean, the book is if people who haven't seen it before. It's gigantic. I mean, there's so many images in it and just so much research went into that to show where this angle of the 76.345 shows up in so many places. And in your presentation there, you're like, you know, you can't find any examples of it in the textbooks and education. And you would think, right, that it would be in sacred geometry books somewhere. Like, you know, because I've got a mountain of sacred geometry books, you know, that I have at my home here. And I flipped through all of them and I can't find one technique in any of these books other than one um, that was just published maybe a few years ago. There's a reprint. It's called Patterns of Eternity uh, by Malcolm Stewart. It's about the star cut diagram. That's how I got interested in this uh, pyramid. He has a picture of the Russian pyramid. And in there, he tries to do an example of trying to show how the slope angle fits on those stacked phi ratio spheres. Um, but I noticed it was a little off. And that was really about two months ago prior to meeting Charlie. Because people who don't know me from Charlie's channel, I work with the golden ratio circles. I mean, platonic solids. So much geometry is about the golden ratio that I do. So I was like, I must be able to find this in these templates that I work with regularly. And sure enough, after putting my mind to it like that, it started to show up there, but all over the place. And it was right there in front of me the whole time. So it was like hidden in plain sight in these diagrams that I can't even find a reference to in sacred geometry diagram uh, books at all. So it's really amazing to me. Well, now, George, I, I have to ask you at this point, do you think... 
I think that this has all been done on purpose. Do you think that 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 knowledge of this angle may have been suppressed out of sacred geometry texts? Well, I'm, I mean, you know, my texts only go back to a certain date, right? I mean, most of them are modern authors. I don't have anything really, uh, you know, falling apart at the binding or anything like that. Um, but we'll see examples of Von Welling's drawing up to like 300 years ago that had a depiction of perfect Russian pyramids. I have that image in my slideshow. So somewhere 300, you know, 500 years ago, those architects that were building all the cathedrals and the things that you showed us, they must have had some sort of compass and straight edge know-how about how to reproduce this to put it on paper that somehow eluded our modern um uh, our modern education of sacred geometry, which is already pretty much out of the, the major education, right? So the type of things you're going to see that I'm going to show you, I feel are really cutting edge and revolutionary. And it's kind of, you know, I'm excited to share this all with you here. And I'm also excited to share it. Um, I've got a class coming up. I'll tell you right now, Charlie and I are going to be, uh, Charlie's going to be in the class this coming Monday, January 9th. Three session work. Won't be teaching. I will not be teaching. I am a student. <laughs> Charlie's going to be a student on that. He's going to share all sorts of other insights, I'm sure. Uh, but I'm going to teach a lot of the techniques you're going to see here. Not all of them. Some are more technical. But I feel like this is a way to get it back into the pattern language of sacred geometry and introduce it back into the stream that may have been diverted somewhere. And these techniques are sacred geometry principles that are going to be infused back into a kind of cultural element, bringing it back to the people, as Charlie had said, to see whatever it inspires and, and sends you on your path at sacred geometry. But that's enough of an intro. Let's let me show you some of the slides. And uh, I'm not going to go through a major demonstrations of the drawings here, but you'll get enough of the insights of what it looks like. And, you know, just what some of the designs, uh, which one is it here? This one here. Um, what the patterns look like, and then what do they inform us about the types of, you got the screen, Charlie, is it on? You're fine. Okay. You're fine. Okay. Let me uh, get rid of this sidebar. Um, so we're going to get a sense of just, you know, what these patterns look like and really how this information, you know, magically relates to the types of things Charlie was sharing, especially those last few slides about the Taurus and its relationship to the platonic solids. This is just really a kind of an overview slide of one of the techniques that I discovered that create the uh, Russian pyramid here shown in blue and the Giza pyramid here is shown in red. Early on in Charlie's presentation, he showed another example of the Giza pyramid down here in the Russian pyramid. And I have techniques to draw it that way too. So, I mean, I've got 26 techniques <laughs> that I can draw this angle when about two months ago I had zero and really no reference point of even how to do it. And basically I applied that this, my knowledge base with the phi ratio and these templates to looking for this angle and came up with 26 unique methods of how to discover it, which is just amazing to me. But let's just talk about the numbers a little bit here of what's going on. Um, I'm basing this drawing on a one inch uh, base length of the Russian pyramid here. So that's gonna give us you know, a height here of 2.05. And then this is the slope height, which is 2.1180. So that's the half of phi cubed number that Charlie was uh, pointing out before. Um, we also have the Giza pyramid here and the base. These are all models that um, you know I've constructed here so we can actually look at the relationship between the two. So all this stuff is transferable between the two images, but I don't wanna bog you down in the numbers, basically, you don't have to do any numbers at all. This is all easy to do with just drawing circles and golden ratio circles. And I found out one of the first drawings that I did put this whole diagram into one of the most iconic drawings in sacred geometry. It's called squaring the circle. Now this is something like a geometer's alchem alchemical puzzle, you know, because basically what this design of the square and the circle, you're trying to create those so that you have a, circumference of the circle that's equal to the perimeter of the square. And the way I do this is with a golden ratio Giza pyramid and our Russian pyramid fits right inside this, uh, you know, ancient alchemical design of the square and the circle. So this is one we're gonna do together 
in the workshop, probably the first drawing we do, because it's not that difficult to do. And you'll be amazed that the pyramid shows up just like that. And it was there the whole time. I never knew it. So, um, Charlie, you feel free to jump in anytime you want here if you have questions or comments. I will. Okay. Just I uh, didn't know if you were poised to say anything there. So that's one example. But like I said, I have many different styles and techniques of creating this. This is kind of the same design as the first one. The other thing I notice is that the relationship of the Giza pyramid, where it intersects the circle that is at the base of the Giza pyramid, it actually gives you the point to send the, the Russian pyramid angle, the 76.345, right back to the center of that circle. Later, you're gonna see that that's gonna become a sphere. And this simple diagram that I'm showing you here is the one that's gonna to relate to the torus, all right? So we're gonna put that all into the structural geometry, but just this simple line of the Giza pyramid intersecting that circle provides the 76.345 angle. That to me was just amazing because I've drawn this a gazillion times and never thought to draw this line back to the center. I mean, I missed it so many times in my studies of like, there was no, it was like invisible to me. It was amazing, Charlie, that it was just yeah. like, why would I draw that line? I'm usually focused somewhere else, but there it is. It's that easy. Yeah, it is, sure, sure. <laughs> so. so it's not like it's a hidden mysterious thing, but the funny thing is to me, well, not funny. I mean, the, the weird thing is it's not in any book. You know, it's not like that simple technique or this, this angle that Charlie's talking about that was all that ancient architecture, you know? is nowhere to be found in the modern, even sacred geometry texts. So, um, so here are the two models of these. And in, in there, we're gonna draw these and we're gonna make the models and I'm gonna show you the templates of even how to make the models from sacred geometry techniques. So we have, a, I have a, a design where here, if I fold up these edges of these triangles on that base of the square, check it out here, like this. This is the outer template of the form. If I fold those up, that's the Giza pyramid, okay? That's what you're looking at right here. And right inside that, that little template, it already contains the Russian pyramid right in there. It's part of the design. So it's not like this is something that is just, uh, you know, some scientific study or whatever. It's right at the heart of sacred geometry techniques. It was in there all, all along. So... Um, the base of that, basically, that yellow square in the middle is that square in this base here is the big square that you see, right? So we basically just folded up these edges and there you go, fold it up and you got the two pyramids, one inside the other. And it's all simply done with compass and straight edge and knowing what lines to connect. And these are the things I'll be sharing, um, you know, in, in, in various different ways. And I think Charlie and I do have probably, I don't know, maybe drop a little nugget out in the coming attractions possibly trying to work another little book and put some of these techniques down in paper revising some material you know getting the sacred yep. geometry in yep. there so something we discussed a little while ago but i'll, I'll put it yeah. out there i think it's very important to document these That's techniques right. not only in the video sense like we're doing but also giving you the the, 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 the ancient text in a modern format of how to do this stuff sure so um now let's just go back to the platonic solids that Charlie showed. This diagram that you're looking at, I know it look, may look busy if you're not used to looking at this, but this looks, this is like Robert Lawler's diagram at the back of um, the book. What I've done here is I'm nesting the platonic solids. This is a big blue icosahedron, this blue one with the crossing lines. There's a dodecahedron in here. This black square is a cube. Now we're going to keep going to the next black cube that's way down in here. And further into this is another black cube. That one is one inch. The medium one is 4.236. We heard that. That's phi cube. Up to this cube, which is the multiple of phi cube again, phi to the six. This is going to be the 17.944. 7 and we could just continue this expansion out of the platonic solids. But notice at each level of the platonic solids, there's that pyramid angle going from 
the cube, smallest cube, up to the next cube that would be this box here, right? So this cube right here, this black cube, that pyramid goes off that sphere all the way up till we reach the next largest cube that contains the whole diagram. So that's going to continue on. That's the V4 to G1 uh, or C, C1, right? C7, mm -hmm. V4 to C7. That's that big cube. That's the 17.94. That's the 4.236. 4 this one right here is one. So those are the three boxes. I might have put an extra box in there. But basically, yeah. you can see what um, is happening is that one cube to the next cube, the next time that cube shows up, is going to be phi cubed, a multiple of phi cubed, on and on and on. So that's a real uh, fractal scaling that's going on there. And I'll just jump ahead quickly because I'll skip these next few slides because today I noticed in a video that Charlie and I did previously, there was a viewer that said, hey, this looks like it relates to Dan Winter's, uh, you know, some of Dan Winter's implosion work. Now, Dan was on the video that Charlie and I did at the symposium. And Dan and I have done a video particularly around his uh, star mother sacred geometry because he describes this as the only 3D fractal or a, an example of sacred geometry or geometry that shows 3D fractal in all directions. Mm -hmm. And that basically, once we go through the basic platonic solids, octahedron, tetrahedron, cube, once you get to that point, you have cubes in the dodecahedron, five in there. And that will stellate to this small stellated dodeca, which creates the vertices to create the icosahedron. Once you go to the icosahedron, you stellate that, and then that becomes this form, which creates another dodecahedron. So basically from this, if you stellate this dodecahedron, well, that's gonna look like this, and that will create another you know, icosahedron. And then you stellate that icosahedron, it creates another dodecahedron, stellation back and forth. Now the jump from dodeca to dodeca right here is one to phi cubed. The jump from icosa to the next icosahedron is phi cubed. The jump from any of these forms to the next form is going to be phi cubed in this scaling factor around phi cubed. So just like Charlie showed with the Mandelbrot set of that fractal expansion on a 2D plane, right? Of seeing how the, the interference book of uh, Richard Merrick, right? He, he had right. that interference right. model showing how the Mandelbrot set is expanding in those circles. Now picture that three-dimensionally around these objects and every fractalization to the next one was a multiple of phi cube going on and on. That's why this is a 3D fractal that Dan is describing and why this is, you know, sacred geometry that isn't 2D anymore. This is, you know, in the hand you know, material of there's the icosahedron, you know, the dodeca, it's all down in there. So, um, okay, so I just wanted to jump to that, um, but let's yeah. just back up a before bit. You, before you leave there, could we go back to that yes. Yes, slide? Sure. I, 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 a lot of my viewers are probably, and I'm not totally familiar with stellation. Could you kind of explain uh, stellation process for, for my viewers? Yes. Yeah, so um, what's happening here is that if if we have a pentagon face of this dodecahedron and we extend the edges of all the pentagon has five edges. Right. So if you extend those edges until they meet again. Right. So let's follow it out on the small stellated dodecahedron. I extend that edge up this way. But meanwhile, that edge is extending and it meets over here. So when those two meet, it creates a star, right? It's going to create one, two, three, four, five, because that meeting place is now a new vertice in space. And when I connect those vertices in this form, even though it looks like it's separate, but if I go one, two, three, that's that triangle right at the top, right? Okay. okay. Now, if I extend these edges, right? Extending that edge, well, I'm going to extend it, that little triangle right there in the middle. That's the right. same size as that triangle. So you extend that edge and you extend the other edges. Well, they're going to all meet and they're going to create the new vertices and the distance here that then create the 20 vertices of this dodecahedron. Repeat the process. This extend these edges, right? You're going to do this form at a next larger scale. 
The thing uh, is, is there will be a next larger scale. And what I'm saying, the next small stellated dodecahedron of this one up here, when you extend those edges, that's mm -hmm. going to be a jump of phi cubed, right? Got it. That's what got it. Yeah. Okay. So stellations okay. are really amazing. It's what creates the fractal movement of this three-dimensional geometry. And it all relates to these phi base forms. You know, they're really... And that's why in the pyramid, we're, we're stacking in phi base circles because there's something about phi and fractality, right? And that's why the Mandelbrot set, when you draw those circles, and why phi cubes keep showing, showing up in that, even with three-dimensional geometry like this, compared to a 2D Mandelbrot set, or compared to how the pyramid is showing up, you know, in the slope angle to the base, or uh, slope to height angle. It's just amazing, right? You know, the phi cube seems to be mysteriously linked somehow behind the scenes to all this. Right, right. Um, so, you know, this was known in the past. I mean, this is what Charlie's book was all about, right? I mean, you showed so many examples and this is one of the first ones Charlie sent me here was the Egyptian hieroglyph of the Temple of Karnak. And I had just done this drawing and it was our first meeting actually, and I showed you this. And you were got so excited. Yeah. Later that day, you were like, <laughs> "I did." <laughs> you sent this to me because, and I laid this over top. So these are the same. Let me just try to describe this. Each of these pyramids you see in here are based off of the in sphere or out sphere of one of these platonic solids. So the out sphere would just be put a platonic solid in a sphere that's around it, and the in sphere would be the sphere inside it. So I basically made pyramids off of each of those, and then I just laid it right over top of this carved in stone and uh, the Egyptian hieroglyph. And look at that, the little gap between the two showed up between a relationship between two of these spheres of the in sphere and out sphere of these two mm -hmm. forms. It would be basically the out sphere of the icosahedron to the uh, in sphere of the icosahedron that was what that one was the in sphere and out sphere are was this distance between those two on that one, which was okay really kind of wild and then even the little notch that was cut in the bottom was this darker one down down here right so sure. anyway we gotta we gotta debrief these and kind of really look at these ancient diagrams here's another one for example charlie had this in his uh, book as well i took the same diagram laid the russian pyramid stack related to the platonic solids over the aztec calendar which has just got you know, stacks of pyramids all the way through it, right? Look how many times the pyramid point shows up in here. And the central circle, I just lined up the central circle around this cube, which is around that octahedron, which is the eight-sided platonic form. I know I'm just dropping, <laughs> dropping names left and right here, but that's the octahedron, right? That's right here, the blue one, right in the middle of that square. There's okay. a sphere around that. There's a circle that I've drawn. I lined it up right on the face, the circle around the face. And just mm -hmm. let's see what happened, right? Well, there you go. Everything just stacks up. Look at this. That hits that circle. This is right here in the notch of that pyramid. That's at the notch of that pyramid, right back to the circle. And those pyramids, remember, they're coming off of the in-sphere and out-sphere of platonic solids. So, you know, I'm not saying that's how they did it or they knew all that. Maybe. I don't really know. But it seemed to fit really pretty nice where we see those points showing up, right? So it's uh, you know speculative geometry here for sure, but correlations that show this was definitely constructed with some knowledge of seventy six point three four five. You know, all sure. that's not not even like really a question. Um, so you know here just to simplify the drawing, taking the platonic solids out, just to show you know if we take out all those in spheres and out spheres of all those forms, and we just do these jumps of how the circles way down in the middle here is the one inch one, but we're just jumping along, boom, 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 boom. The next one would come off of this circle and we'd be off the page, right? But each of those are these fractal expansions that we're describing. And it really seems to be driven by this pyramid that is kind of keeping that scaling factor. Now, I don't wanna keep calling it just a pyramid as because that always implies a square base. You know, the cone inside of it is really uh, what I'm going to switch to now, because that's what's going to be holding, like if we turn it into a torus, right, which is like a sphere. So we're really dealing with something that's like a vortex, like water going down a drain, right? So that's a cone, but there's a, you know, it's encased in like a three-dimensional, three, three, 3D type of shape. So in this, this is something we'll build in the class. 
just this size too. You know, here's the cone that I made that we're gonna make too that fits right inside. So really what that, it's holding the stacked phi ratio spheres and it's also creating the slant angle of a circular base of the cone that we're gonna discuss. So this is that cone on our page now, on, on the presentation. And we wanted to look at how this relates to the golden spiral because what's gonna happen with these golden ratio spheres is that they're really kind of like guideposts for the spiral path to follow. Because this spiral, in order for it to be a golden spiral, means it's going from one golden ratio sphere to the next golden ratio sphere to the next golden ratio sphere, as if they were stacked one on top of another. So pretend this is the same form, which it is scaled to it. And we've got a stack of spheres on top of one another from the top down view. And if you really want to pause the video at some point and study this, you can kind of have fun going around because if we start over here on the left, that's the left side of where this spiral starts. And I know this is square version, but it's easy to draw it that way. Now we're going to go to the back of the cone or the pyramid right over here. And we're going to go over to the right side, which is here, right? And we're going to go towards us, which is up over here. And we're going to hop over to the left again. And you see how that's working, right? We're kind of just, this is a spiral going down and around as it follows this progression in a golden spiral, which will look just like this from above. It will look flat. And I'll illustrate that in, not that slide, but this slide. So what I did was I took that same cone with the 76.34 angle and I mapped out those straight lines. These aren't even curved lines. They're just those same straight lines, folded it up. And when we look down at the top of the cone, what do we see? Well, it looks like a flat spiral, right? Just circular going around. And that's the ascent or descent of that spiral. It's on the backside coming up to the top. And of course we could do that from the eight directions like I've shown here. So we have uh, eight directions shown. We have four spirals on this one, but I did that same thing with the eight spirals and it creates this um, geometry, what some geometers look like might be a kind of image of light or some sort of sound wave structure with these kind of crisscrossing overlapping uh, spirals of light uh, often called. So um, just wanna let you know, like I came up with a really nifty method, a few that produced that cone with just hand-drawn sacred geometry techniques to like 99.99% accuracy, which I was happy with <laughs> because it, you know, you're dealing with the circumference of a circle, which is pi and you know, you got all these factors and you're looking and hunting around like, where's this intersection gonna be to cut that out, right? But look, I could put it right in there and that's, that's what this little cone here, if it's into this pyramid that we just pulled up. So it's just part of the craft, right? It's like you really, you know, I'm hopefully inspiring you to like check out this workshop. Even if you can't make the live, there will be video recordings of this because if you want to make a wizard hat, and I know Charlie took out the, the dunce cap while picture in his slideshow, but it is yep. more wizard's cap than a dunce cap, right? And there had to be some sort of psychological repression in the dunce cap mm -hmm. view <laughs> of why that would be the case. But you know, if you want to make uh, for Halloween or birthday parties or whatever, and you want to know how to make some sweet 76.345 cones, I got a hand-drawn method. It's going to make it, uh, you know, 99.9%. .9%. And if you make a mistake, it might be 100% accurate. <laughs> so uh, anyway, it's very cool. I love finding a method for it. It was really pushed my sacred geometry skills to another level trying to figure that out. So I'm grateful that I can share that with you because you have to wonder how they did it to make a conical shape or how they, you know, for a big cathedral or something like the images Charlie's showing. Like, we better test that out with paper first or something small before we just go right. at it, right? <laughs> so this reinvigorates the pattern language and really introduces some things I don't think you're going to find anywhere else, uh, unless it's, of course, buried away in some secret society or something like that. But for whatever it's worth, I dug through this for the past two months as like my sole focus to discover so many amazing things about this that relate to the pattern language of sacred geometry that are now free for everybody, you know, free for all to have, you know, it's going to be out there. It's going to keep going. 
So um, check it out. Uh, here is the rhombic triconthahedron. And this is uh, the, it goes back to the platonic solids. This form is a 30 sided shape. And it's now a, a form that's made of the icosahedron and dodecahedron. I didn't go over this a lot, but it's a form that relates to the earth grid, which I'll describe shortly. There's a sphere that was inside this form and our cone intersects that sphere. So that's that same 76.345 angle. Now that sphere inside there is thought to be a, a, an earth, let's just say, or you know, definitely a spherical shape. And this is Charlie's image that he sent me around the 76.345 nice spherical tours. So I just, you know, drag and drop, take a look, right? Well, there's our nice sphere of this inside this form. There's our two cones. There's our, you know, phi ratio stack. And there's our spiral. And this is what that spiral would look like as it kind of goes around the outside, gets back to the point at the top, and now spirals down the top back to the uh, zero point. So whatever you'd like to call it kind of at the middle of that whole torus mm -hmm. structure. So, sure. you know, it's, it's just, uh, it's right there. It's like, a, this is really like a conceptual view. We really need probably more people on the team who can animate this stuff for us and, you know, uh, yeah. make it a living thing. But all I know is that the sacred geometry in the 2D, which is a great place to start, everything works out. You know, there isn't any fudging around here. In fact, that's a good point. Like, Charlie, Charlie's numbers for his method of how he approached this compared to the methods that I used, they were exactly the same. Oh, the same, yeah. <laughs> you know, all the way out as far as the digits gave us in the GeoGebra programs we gave us. Right. So once you right. stack golden ratio spheres like this, there's no wiggle room for error, let's just say. I mean, it's just, it's just like a fact. Stack spheres like this, you put a tangent line to each of these spheres, that's going to be 76.345 degree angle. You know, it's, it's like that. So Charlie's and I's methods produce the same things. Let me just check the time here, Charlie. Okay. we got, I got to move along a little bit. So fine. Don't worry about it. Okay. Um, so we have, uh, you know, another example of um, the golden ratio nested rhombic triconthahedron. This is now a nest of those triconthahedron going at increments of phi all the way down, blue all the way to blue. That's the square root of phi. And we got those cones going from all the directions. I think this would make a pretty cool looking piece of jewelry, <laughs> having the little glass yeah. beads of something woven around the spirals around the outside. So, mm -hmm. you know, I'd love to see this type of material become, you know, items that manifest and uh, creative people who have those types of interests can have a field day reproducing beautiful artistic creation. Yeah using this this angle. Um, this is a ley lines of the earth grid model that I constructed using sacred geometry techniques. Um, let me just touch on that briefly. I have a video series on this, but I did make some connections to the earth grid. Of course, this was done by Russian scientists over here that they laid an icosahedral symmetry it was taken further by Becker and Hagens. And looking at that triconthahedron shape, this sloping shape in here is the surface of the earth. See how it comes in contact with the triconthahedron right at the center of those vertices? If I draw a circle right there, that's where the cone is, right? So that cone is on each of these 30 faces. And it's also even on the pentagon faces, which I'll show you in just a moment um, that are part of that form. Each of these white dots would represent one of those points Okay, and here would be the Great Pyramid is located within miles of that location. So that big red thing up at the top there, that triangle, that's the Great Pyramid. And uh, that cone, you know, is positioned, you know, right underneath one of those spots that would go in there. Of course, this is not to scale. <laughs> um, Let's, uh, let's keep going along here. Okay, so, uh, you know, we looked at the triconohedron in the square face of the diamond shape. Now, I also wanted to check out the pentagon face and saw that when we look at the dodecahedron and put the uh, cone into the dodecahedron, the circle that fits right within the pentagram star within that, that's made of five cubes, that circle is the same one that would incrementally get smaller as we go through a stack series of phi ratio progressions. So each of these flat red, blue, black dodecahedron pentagons 
are the same mm -hmm. that you see from left to right here, okay? So one is at the base. Okay. And in there, you have a little circle right? and another circle there and another circle there and another circle at the top. Now, each of those are the perfect circle that would fit right in there and it's fitting right to the scaling factor through these dodecahedra. Now, this is important for, you know, the way Dan Winter uh, looks at the, uh, and his implosion model is based on the pentagon and the dodecahedron. And this 76.345 angle is straight at the heart of that pentagon face. It's right in the central pentagram at the center of that, um, the small pentagon. So we can draw this uh, as well. And I made a model of it just to depict what the cones look like in the dodecahedron. And that's what this complete model looks like here. I have it right here. So basically what I did was I put the, the blue cone is the 76.345 cone. Now it's coming in from you know 12 different directions inside the dodecahedron. And this larger cone that's in there, that's, uh, that's more related to, now we're gonna get into this. We, we didn't get into this in the symposium with Dan, but I had these slides and I need to put them in somewhere. So I'm gonna drop them in now because Dan has a cone, Dan Winter that is, and his research has a cone based on the dodecahedron cone, which is this cone. And he calls it a braided caduceus as it kind of zigzags back and forth, these red and blue zigzag lines. Well, what do you know that when I put the Russian pyramid into the middle of that, those circles are gonna stack at the increments, these gold lines that are going across, it's right at the center of this cone going into the center too. So there's definitely a relationship there to explore. And I'll be talking more with Dan about this because it's inside this cone that Dan has in the dodecahedron and the swirl, you know, the spiral that goes around there, it's actually reproducing the stacked spheres of the Russian pyramid geometry Nothing. right inside that. Okay. Yeah. And it's these two circles that I'm highlighting, this one and this one. And it's all in that dodecahedron structure. So this is more to explore here, you know. Um, can can, one, I, ask a, can yes, I ask a question back there on that slide? I know this one? Uh, the previous slide. Uh, no, the one before it. This one. Yeah, the the blue cones. Uh, no, well, either one. Yeah, the 70, the 63.4 degree cone that uh is it is that the dual or or what is the relationship between that cone and the 76 345 cones my question yeah, yeah. it wasn't the dual cone i have that image coming up here in a second oh okay i mean the relationship that's what i'm still you know this is speculative now i'm still trying to understand this part of it you know the relationship i'm finding is as these um Let's just follow, like, here's a spiral that would be going around that. And the blue crosses right here, right? And right at oh. the crossing section of those, at that black dot of Dan's drawing, right? Right. That's where the first golden ratio circle is. Now, he has a double caduceus, so he has a red one. So let's follow the red one that starts here at that dot. It goes to here, and then it comes back to here, right? That's the next dot. That's the next golden ratio sphere. Now, if I'm sticking with the blue one, I go to here and then I go back to here. Oh, well, what? there's the next dot. There's the next sphere. But if I stick with the red one, it goes to here and then it goes to here. Oh, there's the next sphere. So you see the crossing of those two. Okay. Right? Okay. They're creating the stack of golden ratio spheres. Uh, right. So that's, wow. that's what I was trying to decipher because then there's the pyramid at the core of that whole thing are the stacked yeah. golden ratio spheres because the golden ratio spheres that are stacked in this are different. I have them in light gray here. See, when you put right. spheres in this one, they don't stack on top of each other. They're always going over. They're just kind of, you know, they're still a stack, but they're not at these nodal points, right? And right. these nodal points right. are key. That's so that's what I was trying to show that, that this this geometry is still woven into the heart of that. You know, it's right at the heart of it. It's right in the central layering as we zigzag back and forth golden ratio. There's no way avoiding that this stack of spheres is somewhere inside there. Okay. Okay. 
So definitely, you know, this is something that I need to follow up with him. Maybe we'll send them this video, just this section of it, because I know he's busy, but I think he'd love to, uh, you know, probably see this. One other thing, Charlie, I didn't get to share this one with you much, so I'm dropping a few new ones on you here. <laughs> I'm just, no, that's fine. We got uh, Victor Schauberger's work, which I know you might mention. I came across this image of another type yes. of poem that he worked with, which was based on golden rectangles that reverse back and forth. And I found out that that is in the Russian pyramid or the 76.345, that's the blue. And basically if you put a circle that's half the size of uh, this larger circle here at each of the circle points, right? Of the golden ratio spheres, these four, one, two, three, four, half the size of this one, half the size of that one, half the size of that one, that's that angle of that color, right? So. Yeah. That was just cool, you know? It's like, everything's like linked together. There was a lot of other cones and pyramids that came out of this, um, but somewhere mm -hmm. in this, this was like the root one stacked golden ratio spheres. And then, you know, of the Russian pyramid. And then you had some variation. It's the only one that will ever have all these golden ratio spheres touching one another. It's always gonna be that 76.345 angle. Then you have different ways to demonstrate how that angle will change based on using different size spheres and space spacing around them, okay? So I know this might be technical for a lot of the viewers, but it's just good to see that it's not like choosing something over another or anything like that. Everything in sacred geometry is all interlinked and connected. It's like leading you from one mystery to another to make you see, help you see connections rather than uh, separations of uh, material. It's like all this is a unified field, right? Do you happen to know what the slant or slope angle is of the, the 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 red pyramid that you just developed here? Oh yeah, that's funny. I didn't even put it in there. Uh, <laughs> I, oh, know, that's okay. I I think you said it was somewhere around eighty two or eighty three degrees. It I was think. something like that. I I mean I yeah. just saw it up on my iPad. I would take. I I'm just gonna say this is a, this is obviously a an area for new work, uh, additional research, but the. The 10 to 15 percent of the um, uh, steeples in the Gothic cathedrals have roughly that geometry. So you may have figured out, you may have reverse engineered the remaining, uh, you know, steeples. Uh, we can check that out later time. I know yeah. you sent me that email a while ago and you asked me yeah. about that and I didn't have a reply because I didn't didn't really know so but then i was like that was a mystery for me so i was like where's this 80 something degree angle going to show up and this is the first one that i had in the 80s yeah 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 well that could be it i'll i i, I can figure that out separately and check it out go ahead now this was just you know kind of charlie i did a lot of exploring he sent me some pictures of like a dual cone i had no idea what a dual cone was but i'd already been drawing it <laughs> <laughs> you know it had already been in the diagrams i mean i didn't know what i drew to uh to 76.345 a russian pyramid cones from the four directions two coming this way and two coming from the top that if i just drew a straight line across here that's the dual cone right so that red dish it's a very shallow dish i have all the angles for that of course and in the class, I'm going to just give you some of these that you could build for yourself, but we will draw this. But it's amazing what the sacred geometry contains because it contains things you don't even know what you're looking at until a later date. <laughs> so everything in these patterns usually means something you just don't know. But what I did was, you know, you could see how this two blue up here and these cones coming in from the side, and there could also be one coming straight towards you. That white dish now is the same one that just looks flat here. But um, there it is from the side, okay. just following the angle from top to bottom. That's a little spherical dish. This is tilted to maybe give you a better idea of it. What is this? I don't really know. It looked like some sort of cool thing, energy device, who knows, but it's in the geometry worth exploring and knowing that it's in there, right? Sure. Uh, sure. And figuring out how to connect it to the other four. So um, like I said, Charlie was talking about, this is one that, um, you know, Charlie wasn't familiar with somebody in New Geometers, my Facebook group, just posted this after I started sharing about the Russian pyramid. I love my group. They share so many amazing things and come up with so many unique discoveries. That's on Facebook. You can join that. Uh, New Geometers, K-N-E-W, Geometers. And uh, they posted this and I was like, whoa, that looks pretty darn close to the Russian pyramid. So right underneath this blue line right here 
is a pyramid, right? That I just laid right over top. I mean, it is exact. There was really like a little wiggle room. It went straight from the top to the bottom, no wiggle room. And this is from 300 years ago from George Von Welling, you know, an alchemist at the time studying really esoteric types of things. Um, he uh, also had perfect segmentation of phi ratio along four circles here that line up precisely over circles in the diagram, which was just kind of mind blowing to me because, you know, it goes back to Charlie's question, like the techniques to draw this right here are not really out there at all. I, not that I'm aware of in any sacred geometry lesson or book or anywhere you could find how to recreate the diagram like this with four golden ratio circles, in addition to the pyramid slope angle, right? So that's just really fascinating to me, fascinating to me that what happened during that dark age period that Charlie mentioned, you know, is like, where did it all go? You know, but I'm thankful that, you know, sacred geometry, you know, definitely, you know, holds the key, you know, except for me to feel like this is the language, is the pattern language that anybody can access, that anyone can access, right? You, and if you follow a trail, you know, you have your curiosity, your intuition, you'll be guided through these process. You know, I did this diagram of the two pyramids and I made something interesting out of it. Um, but both of these pyramids are the same in here. I did this before I even saw this diagram. So to see that I created this double pyramid situation with this circle design was right here, was really like, wow, I'm really participating in some sort of amazing language that just has its own universal mind or something, right? I mean, that it's just mm -hmm. contained within these diagrams that we can rediscover and refine many of the lost things that are out there. and you know, take it further. Cause you know, I, shortly after doing this drawing, I was like, cool, let's turn it into a 3d model. And I built a double Russian pyramids, you know, the red and the blue. And I got mm -hmm. lucky with this one. Cause I was like, Oh, I had a ball. I said, let me just pop it in there. So I, I was that. like, it fit right inside the, uh, the, the sphere. So that would be the shared phi ratio sphere between both these pyramids. The only place they'll share that same size sphere would be right there. And I just happened to have the perfect size ball to fit in my little model. Mm -hmm. yeah, yeah. So that'll be another fun one. I'm just going to give people that template. If you want to build something like that for fun, you'll have that available. But like I'm saying, you know, there's a lot of creative uh, possibilities here that you can go with on your own designs. Um, <clears throat> my partner and I, we did these drawings together, mirrored images of the Russian pyramid. This is the first one that we did before I even contacted you, Charlie. In fact, we did these drawings at the bottom here on 11-11 this past year. And then two days later, I saw your video and I said, Charlie, we got to we gotta get together. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> it was, we did these two here. And uh, then these were another ones because this is the design technique that I discovered the night I called you. I was like, once I figured this one out, I was like, all right, that's a signal to call Charlie. I called you up. <laughs> I'm glad you thought I was the Comcast guy. But, yeah, uh, that's right. <laughs> <laughs> but you know, I I started to make these. You know, I it, it, you know I, we can all do this. Um, the techniques are not as complicated as look. We'll be able to do these too. Um, but because I have such a you know background in sacred geometry, different perspectives, views, it's like let's do it with the decagon. Make little slices of pizza with little pepperonis. A fi fi pizza. I call this one. We got the. Uh, 10 Russian pyramids going to the center with the stacked spheres, just beautiful design, you know, would be awesome to color in. Um, but like I said, I've got 24 different types of methods that figured out ways to recreate and reconstruct this angle, all with just doing hand-drawn sacred geometry techniques. Even though these are on the digital computer, I make sure that they're available and easy for us to do just with regular techniques. So here's a little plug just about the Pinnacle Golden Ratio Pyramid Workshop. It's coming up on January 9th, three workshops. I got additional content and, you know, uh, the nets of the forms, you know, it's going to really be awesome. And here's just some of the things, we, you know, we're going to work on creating together, showing you how to scale the drawings, how to make it a fold up models. You can cut them out or you can have the nets to like have the perfect, you know, templates. But I want to show all the techniques to recreate this stuff um, that I've been coming up with. 
And I think it's going to be really like no sacred geometry workshop I've ever done before, because we're going to really have a nice 2D, 3D component. And it's really going to be specific around the two golden ratio pyramids in relationship to one another. <clears throat> so please check that out. Once again, you could check that out at New Geometry Courses. Email me at newgeometry at gmail or newgeometry.space has another write-up. So please check that out and hope to see you there. And uh, I mentioned the Facebook group, New Geometers. There's 2,500 people in this group almost and uh, just great geometers around the world. We really feel like this group is about advancing the art of sacred geometry. And as you can see in this slideshow, this is really a testimony to that advancement in my opinion. So please join me there. The group is really great. They're sharing their discoveries, a lot of uh, fantastic material. So Charlie, thank you for having me, uh, you know, this joint sh sharing, but for your audience, thank you for, uh, you know, having me on your- Absolutely. And well, uh, that's what I got for you. I want you to, you know, follow up with things there. If you have any questions or you want to plug it into when you jump into yours, that's about what I've got for today. Yeah. Well, no, I, I don't, uh, you know, I just want to kind of, reinforce this is stuff that obviously other people in in prior civilizations have known this but i mean we're really getting into stuff and we're going to see the practical applications of that here in just a minute because now i'm going to show you that the three major free energy technologies of the 20th century all use this geometry so i mean if we it, we, you know, we have enough examples in real life now that, that I will show you. But now we also know that from from a sacred geometry standpoint, this all fits together just perfectly like a glove. So, you know, I don't think I think this is really profound information. I can't wait for people to start to apply this, not only geometers, but I, I want to see people taking this in the free energy and the health sectors and start to use this and apply it because we've just got too many examples from too many you know what this is what mankind's been using for thousands of years so this is this is going to be an i think an exploding area of of interest uh not only from from a sacred geometry standpoint but from technology as well so you know we're really excited to be able to bring this to you so what i want to finish up with just briefly is to show you some examples of this um um geometry being used in free energy so that's where we're going to go next if i can get this thing to work let's see let's hold this up here there we go I'll start, you know, I make Russian pyramids and that's what got me started in this. But I and one of the key factors was the the, the research that was done both in free energy and in health uh, by the scientists in Russia with respect to these pyramids. But, you know, in summary, um, they they determined that if the ionization field from one of these pyramids, such as the one that's pictured here on the left, were to be reproduced electromagnetically, it would take all of the combined electric generating capacity of all the power plants in the whole country of Russia to reproduce that uh, that ionization field. And again, we've we've talked about this. That demonstrates uh, correlates perfectly with with enhanced immune function. That's why I haven't been sick in six years ever since I started making these. And that was not the case. Uh, before I, I started making these. Capacitors attached to the top of the pyramid spontaneously charged and blew upward into the sky. The uh, energy field from this pyramid was measured uh, or detected as far away as 185 miles. Um, and there were amazing increases, as I mentioned, in immune function, life expectancy, and agricultural production, all as a result of exposure to these pyramid energy fields. So uh, here's example number one. Now, another big example from the 20th century is the work of Victor Schauberger. We talked about him earlier. He was an Austrian uh, uh, forester and naturalist, and <clears throat> he was best known for using uh, uh what he observed in nature, which were the spiraling flows of water in a stream to uh, come up with free energy technology. This was what was called his vortex home power generator. 
and it uh, alleged to have achieved 10 times over unity uh, in terms of, of free energy production. So if you needed a watt to keep it going, well, it would produce 11 watts. So you'd have 10 times over unity. And so this was essentially a perpetual motion uh, uh, device that, that generated free energy. And sure enough, when you look underneath the hood, so to speak, where Victor is standing and you pull all of that off, you're gonna find this uh, vortex generator here. Water was actually pumped through these pipes and uh, that's what caused the, uh, uh, the vortex to spin at these very rapid rates and produce the free energy. So once again, 76,345 there. I'm gonna show it to you as well. He observed nature. And uh, if you go to the top right-hand corner here, he loved to study fish. These are trout. And he did examples of these. If you look at the 76, 345 geometry, both from the side view and the top view of the fish here, I'm pointing to it with my cursor. Uh, you'll find that that geometry is everywhere. This middle section here is called a, I believe this was called a repulse sign a device. I don't know that he ever made this, but you'll see that this uh, geometric angle is on the back side of this, uh, this uh, generating device. You'll see it in the bottom right-hand corner as well. These were um, uh, some uh, technologies that he put together to increase the flow of water through uh, wooden uh, water pipes. And you'll see this 76, 345 geometry showing up. And then on the left side, we have a, it's called the Heinkel aircraft. It was the first jet aircraft manufactured in the world. Uh, the developer of this got a lot of his technology, stole it from uh, Schauberger. And you'll see that the 76 345 geometry, I'm pointing to it here, shows up not only in the back of the airplane, but also on the side of the airplane as well, just as it does in the top and the side of the fish. So uh, clearly, Victor Schauberger knew about this geometry and used it uh, in, I would imagine, all of his free energy technologies. Nikola Tesla's Wardenclyffe Tower. Nikola Tesla uh, tapped into the Earth's energies, but he used this geometry in the construction of his tower. I would presume, similar to the Thiruvannamali Hindu temple, that it uh, organized um, the uh, the energy flows that were coming up from the Earth, and uh, you know, allowed for the production of free energy as a result. Here's an example, uh, for those of you who know about Coral Castle, this was a, uh, a project developed by Edward Leeds Um, uh, He was a very small man, about five feet tall, but he built this entire uh, complex from uh, coral on the property, but uh, he was able to lift these massive stones with just a tripod and uh, you know a, a set of pulleys and he had some very interesting technology with with respect or ideas with respect to magnetism. You can't see it very well, but at the top of the tripod, there was a box of some of some origin that probably had to do with magnetics. And he used the geometry apparently of the of the tripod in conjunction with his understandings of magnetics to be able to lift these uh, gigantic pieces of coral all by himself. Here's another, uh, this is a 19th century free energy uh, technology uh, researcher named John Keeley. John Keeley uh, had a, a number of uh, discoveries in terms of free energy and also uh, uh, being able to, um, to anti-gravity uh, technologies that he developed. But we can see on the left, uh, I, I'm in the process of trying to get in touch with uh, Dale Pond, who uh, wrote a number of books on John Keeley's work and is kind of a curator of all of his uh, technology and, and works and so forth. But uh, I did find these in uh, the, one of the books that he wrote on Keeley's work. And you can see the uh, vortex mechanics. Uh, we see the kind of the, the, the again, the tor the inside of the torus there. Uh, and uh, this very specific 76, 345 geometry shows up inside of that diagram. On the right, this was a, 
uh, this was one of his water-free energy devices. And you can see that the bulbs that he used uh, in conjunction with that, water would be uh, placed into these bulbs, uh, use this uh, precise geometry as well. So I'm hoping to get more information uh, you know, from uh, Dale about this. And when I do, I'll be doing some extra videos on you know, 76345 and his technologies. So what happened to all of these technologies? The Russian pyramid research was not allowed to be published in the West. Uh, Victor Schauberger's work, he was forced after World War II. He, during World War II, he had to work for Hitler designing um, uh, various uh, military aircraft and, and technology for the Nazis. But afterwards, he was forced under duress to license his technologies to American business interests. Uh, we don't know what happened to them after that, if the U.S. government got them or not, but uh, they were taken out of the public domain. Uh, Nikola Tesla's research was seized by U.S. government uh, upon his death, and it's never been uh, put out into the public. And finally, John Keeley's uh, work, right after his death, there were concerted efforts to discredit his work in the press, calling him a, a fraud and so forth. And uh, most of his research notes and, and his machines were most likely ultimately uh, sent back to the Theosophical Society, uh, which uh, was an organization that he belonged to, uh, in order to uh, keep keep it for safekeeping. But in all four of these cases, this, these technologies have been buried, uh, some by the U.S. government, maybe some by by other parties. But uh, this uh, this technology is basically uh, you know been put under wraps and. Um, it all contained this geometry. So we know that it's important and that's why we're going through the efforts of uh, getting this information out to the public. So again, just to, we're gonna summarize here, to, you know, uh, follow up with George uh, with his workshop. That's gonna be on uh, on the 9th. And again, George, tell people where they should go to, to look that up. Yeah, new, new geometry to, to contact courses. you. New Geometry Courses, K N E W Geometry Courses dot com. Okay, and then finally, um, if you're interested in uh, our pyramids, uh, you can purchase those at StargatePyramids.com. Uh, my partner Lisa Richard makes capstones and accessories for them as well at PyramidSurge.com. And uh, in either case, if you use the uh, coupon code no PayPal 30, you'll get 30% off of your orders. Uh, so we thank you all for uh, for listening. I'm going to stop the share right now. And uh, George, I don't know. Do you have some some words you'd like to finish up with? No, it's just fantastic to do another video with you, Charlie. And I felt we had a little more less time constraints in this one than the symposium That's one. Right. So we really let it go all together and we broke it into the few sections there. And um, I'm really thankful that both of our research streams have come together in the past uh, two months, really, and uh, that we were able to produce this awesome content and make new discoveries along the way. So I'm just thankful for all the viewers that have joined us on this journey. And uh, look forward to, uh, you know, maybe seeing you at the workshop or subscribing to my channel for the other sacred geometry that I reproduce. And remember, check out the New Geometry's Facebook group. I think you might really enjoy that if you have an interest in learning more about sacred geometry. So that's about Fantastic. it. Fantastic. Everybody, and I really appreciate doing this one again with you, Charlie. Okay. Well, I'll, I'll just say this. I'm looking forward to your class. Um, I, you know, fortunately I knew enough to be able to figure it, come up with an idea of stacking spheres <laughs> to get us to hooked up together. Cause that's really was the missing link. So I'm looking forward to learning how to draw, uh, sacred geometric forms before I forget what will people need for the class, uh, before they start. Right. Well, uh, the compass and straight edge. Uh, okay. are two things. I mean, I have a list of materials, you know, when you sign up that will be given okay. here, but um, it, you know, compass, straight edge. So uh, I don't have my tools right here, but you know, the regular drawing compass, one that's good, one that locks into place. It's not one that you did when you were younger that made you hate geometry. 
Um, <laughs> you know, is it get, get a, a decent compass. Staples or Michaels or some sort of craft store usually has the ruler, the pencil, and an 11 by 14 drawing pad. And that's it. It's totally for beginners. The techniques that are in this one are not super advanced. You know, they're not going to be really hard. It's amazed to how easy this is to reproduce this angle. But we're going to do some other interesting technical related drawings to it once you get to your feet underneath you and you're going to have extra videos to kind of take your exploration further with some other designs. So, you know, it's really going to be jam packed. We're going to do some model building form. So really just, you know, the compass, the straight edge and, um, you know, you could cut these right out of the paper and make these, but I'm going to give you the printable nets and things so you can make these, which, you know, are going to have mm -hmm. less imperfections than our hand drawn. So, Things like this are going to be available. I'm even going to give you all the templates if you want to go for it. <laughs> I'm going to give you the whole template. You can make this and I'll describe how you can just tape it together and use hot glue to put it together. So I'm really going all out with all this content because I have so much of it and I really want to get it out to people because it's just sitting you know, here. And uh, I think it's just great for people to interact with. So it's going to really be a lot of fun. I'm just thankful Charlie's going to be there. It's going to be really great to have you there. Oh, I can't wait. I, 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 we're going to have to do something like this as well, I think, for the audience so they can figure out at least how to make cones maybe on their own without no, all of we'll the heartache this, that we'll I put them through. The audience too. Yeah, and the course will always be there for all the content that's yeah. going to be available, but we'll have a, you know, I'll do a video of the basic technique so people can do it and get started doing it in a very simple way too at some point, you know? So, sure. well, um, well, and I'll just finish up by saying if there are people out there who are interested in either health or uh, free energy applications, you know, uh, contact me if you, you know, have some serious interest in, in trying to explore some of these topics. Uh, we'll figure out ways that we can uh, start some research uh, going with you and uh, look forward to, to hearing back. But, you know, I'd particularly be interested in people who who know electricity and would know how to to, to perhaps if we build a, a a pyramid of sufficient size, how we could 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 do a demonstration model of uh, free energy technology there as well. So uh, all of those are great ideas. So we look forward, both of us, to to hearing from you. And uh, um, until uh, next time, I, I guess I'll just say it's uh, we're we're probably out of time now. Uh, we thank you for watching, and uh, you have a great day. All right, everybody. See ya. Bye. Much love and peace. Bye. Bye. -bye.